Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the PCOS Revolution podcast. I'm here today with Dr. Laura Bryden, who is a naturopathic doctor and the period revolutionary. She's leading the change to better periods. And we're going to talk today about uh, some topics she discusses in her book, The Period Repair Manual. And for those of you who don't know her or haven't read her book, I would strongly encourage you to check out her website. We'll definitely list the link for that here. Um, so the the uh, period repair manual is actually a manifesto of natural treatment for better hormones and better periods, and it provides practical solutions for using nutrition, supplements, and natural hormones. It's now the second edition, and it has been an underground sensation and it's worked to quietly change the lives of tens of thousands of women. So I'm very excited to talk about this today. Welcome, Dr. Bryden. Hi, Farrar. Thanks for having me. So let's start off with um, what really sparked your interest in working with the cycle and women's health and PCOS as well. Yeah, well, I've been doing working with in women's health as a clinician, as a naturopathic doctor for almost 25 years. <laughs> I guess it's a long time. So I've been working with women with period problems all that time, spanning back to the days when in the 90s, you know, no one was really yet talking about how diet can affect PCOS. The main surgery back then was something called ovarian drilling, which is a mm -hmm. surgical procedure, which is really bizarre to think about now. But even back then, I sort of from a naturopathic perspective, we'd been taught that you know there can be an element of blood sugar or insulin. So yeah, I was I've been sort of coming at it. In different ways, yeah, for the last couple of decades, and of course, seeing great results because it's the kind of condition that responds better to natural treatment, lifestyle treatment, than it does to really any conventional medicine. Definitely, it's so rewarding too to see yeah. improvements with the cycle uh, just by making a few changes here and there. So definitely, uh, so I we were talking a few minutes ago about what uh, is going on with the whole landscape of women's health and how, you know, there you're seeing, and I, I see sometimes in my practice that um, PCOS might be becoming overdiagnosed. And could you talk a little bit about, about why that is? The problem is the ultrasound finding. So here's a takeaway, which I'm sure has been said on your podcast before, but it needs to be said again, needs to be stated. PCOS is a hormonal condition that cannot be diagnosed or ruled out with ultrasound. You know, I, it's, um, it's quite a problem. So there's both an overdiagnosis problem with this condition and an underdiagnosis problem, as you probably know. So on the overdiagnosis side of things, you get a lot of young women, especially young women, who are being mistakenly told they have PCOS based on the finding of polycystic ovaries, which can't be can't be used that way because one of the big changes is that since the guidelines since the Rotterdam guidelines were made in 2003 the sensitivity of the ultrasound technology has increased hugely so now we're it's it's much easier to pick up to see more follicles and their follicles are eggs which are normal for the ovary they're not cysts the way we have other kinds of abnormal ovarian cysts so it, it's common it's normal for young women to have more eggs in their ovaries. So almost by definition, being young, you're going to have polycystic ovaries. There's one statistic where I think up to 86% of normal women will show polycystic ovaries on an ultrasound at one time or the other. So as soon as you combine that finding, which is essentially a normal finding, with, it doesn't take much, you know, having irregular periods for some other reason, maybe it's post pill, or more commonly under eating. So one of the things that concerns me the most is seeing women who actually have under eating or hypothalamic amenorrhea, that's the term for losing your period due to under eating, being mistakenly told they have PCOS and going down the wrong track. So that's, that's, the, that's on the overdiagnosis side. I'll just finish up by saying on the underdiagnosis side, I also see women who have insulin resistance, it, anovulatory cycles, no ovulation, irregular cycles, signs of male hormone, and I say, well, I think this is PCOS. And they're like, oh no, my doctor ruled that out. I have my ultrasound is normal. So that's been ruled out. It's like, no, <laughs> no, you can have the condition, the full blown condition and have normal ovaries on ultrasound. So I really hope that's clear. I would like to see that the ultrasound finding removed completely from the diagnostic criteria. I think that's gonna help a lot going forward. Mm. Yeah, 
<laughs> That's so good that you said that because I, and also they're not recommending ultrasounds uh, to diagnose PCOS in adolescents either. So that shouldn't yeah. really be a criteria. Thank goodness. Of course. And the reason is because they have, they have multiple eggs or follicles in their ovaries because they're young. Exactly. We have more eggs when we're young. It's definitely, I still see a lot of confusion out there um, yeah. about, about diagnosing PCOS. It's not easy. And uh, it, but the hallmark is definitely when you look at your period and it's over 35 days, like you mentioned, there, there's, that's, that's definitely a warning sign that you need some further investigation. And, and so I've seen sometimes where the hormone levels look almost normal as well, but the, all of the symptoms are there. So that's interesting too. So in period repair manual and on my blog, I'm just about to release a new blog post about this. I talk about the different types of PCOS, what I call functional types. So these are different than the phenotype diagnostic types that have been put forward. This is looking at what are some of the main underlying, underlying drivers of which of course, insulin resistance is the most common. But when you look at it from that perspective, yeah, you can, I'll just give the example of adrenal PCOS, which affects, it's a, it accounts for about 10% of PCOS diagnoses. That's quite a different condition in that there can be regular ovulation, which is, there can be longer cycles, but regular ovulation, which is quite different than the classic type of PCOS, but yet have these high androgens or male hormones from adrenal function, excess adrenal production. And if you start to think about it that way, yeah, it makes the diagnostic criteria even a little bit murkier than they were to begin with. Um, the way I diagnose, the way I would define PCOS these days, I think the most maybe foolproof way to define the condition is it's a condition of excess male hormones when all other causes of excess male hormones have been ruled out. So that would include, of course, something called adrenal hyperplasia, which you've probably heard about. It's a genetic condition that of um, adrenal overproduction of androgens. And that it's actually quite common. It's about one in a hundred women who are almost mm. always misdiagnosed as PCOS to begin with. It's a different condition. It needs different treatments. The other, you know, there's other things that can kind of cause a high male, high male hormone picture. That would be high prolactin. The other situation of high male hormones that does get diagnosed as PCOS, and I think is quite a, sort of a particular special case, is post-pill. So in my work, I talk about that as post-pill PCOS. That's particularly when trying to come off um, a drosperinone pill, which would be Yasmin or Yaz, or a Cipterone pill, which you don't have in the States, but in Australia, we have Diane and mm. Brenda is the brand name. Trying to come off those pills can cause a temporary surge in androgens or male hormones during which time, you know, that can go on for six months or 12 months, irregular periods, quite severe acne, what I call pill withdrawal acne. That, that by because PCOS is really just diagnosed based on symptoms. I mean, that, that puts women under the diagnostic umbrella of PCOS, and yet it's a temporary situation. And a lot of people have talked about, yeah, there's, there can be, women can be in temporary, a temporary state of PCOS, whether because they're either because they're young or post pill. And that is not, actually not the same as the, the full blown condition, which is really a lifelong condition. Right. So that would be interesting if somebody actually was told to go on birth control because cycles are regular or acne uh, or slightly just a, maybe just acne. Yeah. That sometimes that's enough reason to put, be put on birth control and they come off the pill their cycles are irregular. They've got more acne, more weight gain. And now they're saying, well, maybe I have PCOS. But you're saying it could take probably six months to a year for your body to kind of normalize off the pill, depending on how long yeah. you've been on it. Okay. That yeah. makes so a lot of my, sense. Yeah. With my patients in that situation, I would say, okay, right. So we have this PCOS diagnosis for whatever it's worth. Let's just kind of leave that on the back burner for now. Deal with this more as a pill withdrawal situation see where we can get you in terms of cycle length and skin over the next 12 months and then see if the diagnosis still applies. And the other thing to say, when you're putting young teens, so putting teenagers on the pill for skin and irregular cycles, here's the thing, because you mentioned about the 35 day cycle as kind of the cutoff for what would be considered a normal cycle. That's true for adult women 
So for teenagers, I'd say really anywhere younger than like 22 or 23, it can be up to 45 days mm. is normal. You have a longer follicular phase as a young woman, a teenager. Mm -hmm. So I, well, that's why some of the guidelines are now really that the condition should, it should not, the diagnosis almost should not be given to teenagers because there many of, most of us are in a temporary state of PCOS when we're teenagers. That said, of course, some teens are in a much more serious um, state with a high degree of insulin resistance. That would be different. But all of us are a little bit insulin resistant, a little bit high androgen, anovulatory cycles, longer cycles as teenagers. Some people talk, some researchers talk about it as, yeah, puberty is, it's the kind of PCOS state of puberty is sort of a natural, it's part of the developmental states of the menstrual cycle. So first you go into the slightly androgen dominant state, not ovulating regularly. And then once you start to ovulate, your estrogen and progesterone kick in and both of those have regulating effects and actually anti-androgen effects that help to mature the menstrual cycle. One thing that's interesting about the menstrual cycle and the communication between the brain and the ovaries is it takes 12 years to mature that. So from the time, you know, you say you start your periods at 13, it's not until you're 25 that you progress through all those stages and are making optimal levels of progesterone from ovulation, have hopefully down-regulated androgens, things like that. So that's actually a really strong argument to not give the pill to teenagers because it interferes, potentially interferes with that maturation process. That's very interesting. And as you were yeah. talking about that, the wheels started turning like, okay, I remember learning that you are more more insulin resistant during the second half of your cycle yes. because of the estrogen mountain, right? So then birth control also potentiates insulin resistance. And so if we are on birth control for the time of our lives where our bodies are still adjusting to our estrogen levels, like what does that do to us, you know, <laughs> long term? So, you know, it's actually long been known and there's numerous studies to show that the pill worsens or causes insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So more than one expert has chimed in saying, why are we giving a drug that causes insulin resistance to a condition that is driven by insulin resistance? So yet another argument, it, it actually really makes no sense to give the pill for PCOS. I just want to say something else about that. I mean, the pill, so the pill is a band-aid for each and every period problem. That's the paradigm we live under currently. That's That's the what I call narrative, the women's health narrative that we exist under currently. That's not how future generations are going to manage period problems. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because the pill was invented before anyone really understood how the menstrual cycle works. So we're using an outdated drug. And that's a problem for almost every type of period problem. It's just a band-aid, potentially worsens some of the underlying conditions. But that's actually particularly true for PCOS because A... It worsens some of the underlying drivers, including both inflammation and insulin resistance. B, it's supposedly given to regulate the menstrual cycle, which just think about that for a minute. It, it can't do because a menstrual cycle is about having ovulation and the production of progesterone and a, the functioning of the ovaries on a cyclic basis. The pill bleeds are just a withdrawal bleed from contraceptive drugs that are taken arbitrarily. There, there was never a reason to bleed monthly on the pill. It, it makes no sense. It, it means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's actually true in some countries now, especially in the UK this, earlier this year, they introduced new official recommendations that there's no reason to bleed monthly on hormonal birth control. So we can dispense with that whole myth or <laughs> idea. So back to, it really raises the question, why then, why on earth are we giving, giving women these drug-induced bleeds when it means nothing and is worsening the underlying condition? The other way I like to say it sometimes is, so PCOS is a, it's a problem with usually, not always, but usually insulin resistance and failure to ovulate regularly. And so supposedly we're treating that with a drug that causes insulin resistance and suppresses ovulation. Mm -hmm. So it, 
really does nothing for the condition. And that doesn't mean that, I'll just put it in the broader context, that doesn't mean that I'm anti-pill for everything. I mean, I know there are other conditions out there like endometriosis where pain, you know, there's pain and other symptoms that do require sometimes some suppression, hormonal suppression, but PCOS isn't in that category. Mm -hmm. The only thing that the pill can do for PCOS is it potentially, you know, some, depending on which pill you take, can suppress androgens mm -hmm. or male hormones, which of course is welcome because it can clear up skin and suppress facial hair to some degree, but only as long as you take it. But it also then, causes hair loss, right? Is yeah. Like, causes, yeah. <laughs> but, and it's only as long as you take those drugs, because actually when you stop them, those symptoms come back worse than they were before. That's the withdrawal that I was talking about. So you can see, I mean, I'm just at the point where I am just like, what, what have we been doing mm -hmm. with this, these drugs and this condition? There's just so many other treatments that work better including just simple metformin. I mean, I think, I still think there are the lifestyle treatments and some of the supplements work a lot better even than metformin, which is the, the diabetic drug that's given, but at least that, even the, the metformin is at least doing something to treat the underlying problems. Definitely. And I think that we are, uh, I was on an interview with uh, Dr. Christian Northrup and she, yes. you know, mentioned women's health is still in the dark ages. <laughs> we are doing something that like you mentioned was, you know, it's 50 years old and we haven't I thought know. of anything new. <laughs> What's I, going on? So, I, I, yeah, I love her work. I, I the quote of Christian Northrup's that I use in some of my presentations quite often, which is that she put it like, because we, we think of the standard version of human is male, you know, we're, we've all been conditioned to think there's something wrong with the female body, which is so profound because it's true. The reason there's been such a lack of research into how menstrual cycles work is because we've been, scientists have sort of been treating the male as the normal and then the menstrual cycle as this kind of add on, if anything, a liability kind of complicated thing. And I'm trying to flip that whole script and just say, having a functioning menstrual cycle where you ovulate and make progesterone and everything's happening with the ovaries, that's how the human body works. That's how the, I would say the standard version of the human body, which is, I say is the female body, how, it, how we work. So huh. yeah, time for a massive revolution in women's health. And I love that you're doing this work because it's so needed. And I think what's happened is that women are waking up to this and going, wait a minute, I'm not sure if this is actually, a, we were speaking about a, a study that surveyed almost 700 women with PCOS. And they said, the question was on the survey, if there was another alternative yeah. to birth control, would you be interested? 99% said yes that they were interested in an alternative solution to, to PCOS. So I think that, you know, the, the, the women, women need to be listened to, to be heard and, and to, and also to be educated that there are other solutions. And if you're now, a lot of women will come to us and say, well, I am using this for contraception also, and I just don't know of any other solutions. Uh, you know, so there are other ways, like, let's just talk about some alternatives to birth control. If you're using it you know, if you are using it as a contraceptive, but you are noticing that the side effects are happening or you just don't want to be on it any longer and kind of want to see what your cycle can do. Um, and definitely there's a big fear of coming off birth control as well for a lot of women. Um, so those are two big issues, but um, what would you say your favorite form of contraception should, would be, you know, for women? Okay, that's a really good question. Yeah, so let's talk about all of that. I'm just gonna start by saying one of the big side effects. I sort of mentioned one of the big side effects of birth control you mentioned hair loss. That's one of them. The other big one is mood, right? Depression and anxiety, which women, actually women and scientists have known about for 60 years, but it keeps being just said, oh no, no, that's not a thing. You're just imagining that that's not a thing. And then finally, end of 2016, there was this massive study out of Denmark where they, they demonstrated that pretty clearly and even you know, stated that it's probably an underestimate. I would say that most women who take the pill notice some effect on mood. And so as far as I'm concerned, that is just not acceptable. We know the pill changes the shape of the brain, for example. Now, in terms of alternatives for birth control, the other thing to say is this is another outcome of 60 years of these contraceptive drugs is there just has not been the research into alternative methods of birth control that there should have been. 
for example, we should have more male methods than we do because if you just think about it, men are fertile every day. Women are fertile only six days per cycle. So the obvious target for birth control is men. We already do have condoms, of course, which I am a huge fan of. And I'm trying to revive condoms because they are new. I don't know if your listeners know, but they're there's new technology in condoms that is more comfortable, that is thinner. There's one brand of condoms where they have 60 different sizes so that your partner can find one that actually fits and feels okay. It doesn't slip. It doesn't break. And so condoms need a you know, bit more of a revival, I think. Um, but the, there should be other male methods, including there's one coming, which I do. I have a blog post called the five best types of natural birth control. That's on my blog. And I, I mentioned this one there, I think it's called basal gel. It's a reversible contraceptive method for men. It's non-hormonal. It's a one-time injection of a gel into the vas deferens. It's kind of like a reversible vasectomy, but it's just a little office visit. Like it's just an office visit with a needle. It's nothing, it's not surgery like women would have to do to have something like this done. So there's that, it hasn't come to market yet, but I'm really hoping that will come to market because it could change everything. Mm. Then, Beyond that, we have fertility awareness-based methods, including the device Daisy, which I am a pretty huge fan of. Daisy's a little computer thermometer, has an algorithm. So all you have to do is take your temperature, tell it when you get your period, and it can tell you when your fertile days are and when your non-fertile days are. Mm -hmm. And this is the basic principle of fertility awareness method. You, If you know when you're not fertile, and if you're in a committed relationship, you can have unprotected sex on those days. And this is even true for women with PCOS. I know that often the argument is, well, women with PCOS, you know, have irregular cycles and can't rely on a method like that. But my approach is actually most women with PCOS can reestablish natural regular cycles, semi, at least close to regular cycles. And you can use a, a method like DAISY or fertility awareness method, even with longer cycles, you ovulate later, but that's okay. That's still, you can still figure out when that is. And so there's that. There's the copper IUD, which are Paragard, which has no hormones, which doesn't interfere with hormones or ovulation or anything like that. It works locally. I, I don't 100% love the IUD. Probably some of your listeners are thinking, oh, but there's, the, you know, the IUD can make periods heavier. And yes, those things are true. I, I'll just refer to my blog post again, all this um, sort of free information. I have a blog post called the pros and cons of the copper IUD. So mm -hmm. you can read through some of the numbers and stats on different potential side effects, but still lots of women do love it. So it's worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. There's a new diaphragm out there now. Have I missed? <laughs> so there's a few things, you know, there's a few mm -hmm. options. It's not just hormonal birth control or nothing. That is part of the narrative of birth control that has got to change because we currently have other methods and scientists should seriously be working on some other methods because to have to shut down a woman's hormonal system with contraceptive drugs to avoid pregnancy is just massive overkill. Would you agree? Like we, the, it's, so it's 2019, like surely we can come up with another way to avoid pregnancy, but doesn't involve shutting down hormones or sometimes I say, you know, castrating women because that is what those drugs do. Mm -hmm. they, shut down I, ovarian, they shut down ovarian function. I, I agree. And I think it's time for that. So until then, we, we have to do, we have to look at what we have. But I think that, you know, starting to know your cycle and know your body is very important and your fertile window for sure. Uh, and it's kind of fun to like learn about your temperature. It's maybe it's not, you know, our, our patients say, oh, God, this is a lot of work, but maybe we don't have to do it forever. Maybe you just do it for a couple of months just to figure out what the heck your hormones are doing. And, and then we can sometimes identify other things that were hard to see. I mean, we've looked at temperatures and said, well, we need to test your thyroid because <laughs> these yeah, are exactly. low. <laughs> you yeah, exactly. all kinds of things. And you can learn how the supplements are working that you're taking and about your luteal phase and so many things. So I think it's worth exploring. Maybe it's a good time to do it, you know, when you're, um, you know, on a regular schedule, if you're traveling and all that, it might not be the right time. But um, do you encourage your patients also to chart their temperatures? Yeah, I do. And like you, I do hear some women saying that feels like a lot of work. So for some, some women love it and just em embrace it from day one and just 
people who are really active in the fertility awareness method community, you know, make the point, it just takes a minute in the morning and you gain all this information and they really kind of anchor, use that their cycle tracking as kind of an anchor to know where they're at with their health. And I think that's fantastic. At the same time, I think, you know, yes, there's some women who just don't want to do it that often. So what I would do in that situation with my patients is first, first I would, I don't want them tracking temperatures when they first come off the pill and aren't cycling yet, because mm-hmm. that can just be an exercise in futility and feel really frustrating. So I would usually say, come off the pill, use barrier methods or withdrawal. I will mention withdrawal is actually a method for what it's worth. Mm-hmm. You can read about some of the stats on that on my blog post, mm-hmm. but use some other method. And then once you've had a couple of, cycles, ovulatory cycles, cycles where ovulation happened, then start tracking temperatures because then you've got something to look at. Because, and this is particularly true with PCOS, the hallmark of the condition, when it's, when the condition is kind of full blown, there would be mainly what are called anovulatory cycles. So you're still bleeding, maybe irregularly every couple months or something like that, but they're, they're not cycles in that ovulation didn't happen. So in that case, there's nothing to see with the temperature because the temperature tracking is tracking ovulation and the temperature change that occurs with that. So I hope that gives a beginning of a guideline. The first step is to get ov- start ovulating, which is usually highly doable with diet and lifestyle and supplements. Then start tracking and have a look at yeah, when that luteal phase is happening, that post-ovulation phase. For sure. And I think that's such a great insight to teach girls too about this. I mean, I feel like that should be taught for sure, you know, and, and you have sex ed, but you also have learning about your cycle. I mean, I, how great would that be? That's probably not going to happen. A radical, but <laughs> radical idea, isn't it? Like to teach girls about tracking fertile mucus and temperatures and teach girls that ovulation is a good thing. It's how we make hormones. It's how we mature our menstrual cycle. That the phrase for that is body literacy, which I love, you know, tracking, understanding what the, what the body does. What I've said a few times is that if, you know, if men had to ovulate or cycle to make their hormones, they'd never stop talking about it. You know, it would be, the menstrual cycle would be a major event. (laughs) Ovulation would be a major event because it's how you make hormones. And wasn't there a male birth control pill? I thought there was. It was taken off the market or I was reading There is one trying to come to market and it's having mixed results. Men don't like the side effects. And my view is why should they? I actually don't really want men using hormonal birth control either. I feel like that is just an outdated technology for both sexes. So true. And if you are trying to come off birth control, uh, what is your book talks about certain strategies you can do, but um, what are some symptoms to look for? And, you know, what are some good strategies that you use with your patients? Okay. Well, I think the first thing is to know which pill you're trying to come off. So if you try, like I said, if you try to come off Yasmin or Yaz, that's got a drug called Drospirone in it. That can cause a particularly vicious kind of post pill acne <laughs> because you get this surge in androgens and skin oils. So, and that usually starts about three months off the pill, peaks about six months off the pill. And that your listeners, I mean, they may have tried coming off and experienced that before, or they may just need to know this. So, if that's, if put it this way, if you had skin problems when you were younger and you've been on Yaz or Yasmin, and you're gonna to try to come off, you need to think about your skin straight away because mm-hmm. the skin problem is going to be worse than it was before you took the drug. So I have a blog post, I have a blog post for most of these things. I have a blog post called How to Treat and Prevent Post Pill Acne, where I talk about that mechanism, where I talk about putting in place strategies, including a dairy free, sugar free diet, zinc. I use the supplement DIM or diandole methane quite often to, as an androgen suppressing supplement, mild androgen suppressing. Combination of those is it has to be quite reasonably high dose zinc, not just a little bit of zinc in a multi or something, but some proper zinc. That combination plus possibly some other supplements can make a huge difference. You, you might still get some pill withdrawal or post pill acne, but you probably come through it a lot easier than you expected. 
and also knowing that at the six month mark, six months off the pill, you, most women turn the corner and the skin starts to improve anyway, especially if you're having regular cycles by then and making estrogen because estrogen is really good for skin. Okay. Yes. We've had this uh, experience where some of our patients have, when they've come off birth control, um, they're concerned because the acne is just like, boom, full force. That's where it is. Yeah. And, and it's, it happens very quickly. I've noticed it's like within days sometimes. Oh, within days. Okay. Well, if within days is less common. I usually see maybe a little bit within days, but usually it starts to really ramp up about the three month mark. And then at six months, like peaking around the time, most women would think, Ooh, okay. There must be something really wrong with me. You know, this is out of control. I must need these drugs. I'm going to have to go back on. Mm -hmm. So at least knowing there's this time frame can help, can encourage to keep going and get, because once you get through that withdrawal process of coming off drospirenone, then yeah, the skin, the skin, you know, it, the skin all is kind of normalized. You start to get more normal hormones are, to say again, both actually both estrogen and progesterone have anti-androgen effects. So once we really get going in our cycle, our own hormones are going to help our skin. Very interesting. Yeah. And you talk a little bit about micronized progesterone. When would you use that? That's an interesting one with PCOS. So that's natural progesterone capsules. It, yeah. So it can be good for skin, has an anti-androgen effect. The other way that micronized or natural progesterone capsules gets used and I don't routinely do this but I'll mention it because it's in my I mentioned it in my book there's been a um, couple articles written recently by Professor Gerilyn Pryor she's an endocrinologist a reproductive endocrinologist with great insights into the menstrual cycle she has something called that she calls cyclic progesterone therapy where she gives her recommendation is two weeks on, two weeks off with progesterone capsule. And the idea is it helps to regulate cycles potentially. What, what it does, it, it actually helps to normalize the communication between the brain and the ovaries. So your listeners, you probably know the classic feature of PCOS is having hot, quite high, chronically high or elevated LH, that pituitary hormone, that sort of not, because normally we should have quite low LH to the cycle, except just before ovulation and then it shoots up. So that's, having this chronically overproduced LH interferes, well, for one thing, it stimulates androgens or male hormones. And the other thing, it interferes with the normal process leading to ovulation. So progesterone suppresses LH. That's the gist of what she's doing with that. So it's something I've used it. I've recommended it occasionally. I actually find, depending on the age of the woman, I actually find younger women respond just as well to getting the sugar out, taking magnesium, taking zinc. Mm -hmm doing all, exercising, doing all those things can make quite a big difference. And so I don't necessarily know that everyone with PCOS needs to go straight to a cyclic progesterone therapy, but it's worth knowing that it exists and that Professor Pryor's writings about that exist. Very helpful. Yeah. And we'll link yeah. to that as well. I think that is uh, a question that we get asked. Sometimes we do use the bioidentical progesterone cream or, or, um, Yep. you know, drops and especially for PMS or for very irregular cycles and that sort of thing and, and working together with herbs uh, and a good healthy diet and, and just a short term thing, not always, not long term because we don't, that's the opposite of what we want. <laughs> so we don't want anyone to be reliant on, on hormones and other things. We want your body to actually start producing things on its own. So, um, but it can be like you mentioned a solution for someone. Uh, and I think that's, a good discussion to have with your practitioner. And for those of you who are looking for some, some more of these suggestions and, you know, trying to kind of get a, uh, some sort of um, hold on what's going on with your cycle and that sort of thing. Um, I think that Dr. Bryan's book, the period repair manual, it's a good place to start for sure. And, you know, really dig deep into your hormones. And um, I think that we all need to experience a healthy cycle. That's just part of it would be, I think, you know, one of the biggest things for women with PCOS is that when you don't have regular cycles, you just, sometimes you don't feel like yourself. And um, so this is very important work that you're doing, I think. And regular cycles are important for long-term health too. This is worth mentioning. So regular cycles where we ovulate and make progesterone, is really important for, well, the long-term health of the reproductive system, actually protecting the uterus from thickened uterine lining. Also, um, bone health, brain health, 
helping to prevent, reduce the risk of breast cancer, all of those things are helped by having cycles where we ovulate and make progesterone. Definitely. In Scientific American, it's been my favorite issue. I think, I don't know if you saw May's, it. Yeah. May's issue. It was all about uh, you know, women's yeah. health and, and the whole article is, do we really need a period? What's the purpose of a period? You know? uh, and so, and the conclusion was, yes, <laughs> me too. She quoted so. Professor Pryor in that article, actually. Ah. Um, Geraldine Pryor, who I've just mentioned. Yes. So yes, saying it's good for long-term health to have yes. a regular cycle. Excellent. Real cycle, not a pill bleed. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think this is just such good information. And uh, if you are currently struggling with PCOS or you have uh, perhaps your daughter is considering going on birth control or you're, you know, wrestling with what to do, um, definitely pick up this book. Start to educate yourself on other alternatives first. Just know that they're out there and uh, of course, that's definitely a personal decision and, you know, um, there's no right or wrong way, but definitely consider, you know, the, the side effects and also the pros and cons. That's, that's all we're asking for sure. So thank you so much, Dr. Biden, for being on our show. And I really look forward to reading more and more about your work. I love your blog and uh, we'll definitely be sharing your posts that you mentioned as well. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time.